Hello you guys. So today I thought I'd do a slightly more awake version of my go through of uh, Politics of the Late Republic, the OCR module for Classive A-Level, because the last time I did it I was absolutely exhausted um, and I think it definitely showed. So I thought I'd go over it a bit more properly today. Um, this will be quite long, but I think it will be worth it. I'm tired, but I'm not as tired as I was then. I think that stream was at like, mid well, it wasn't midnight. It was like nine o'clock, but it was quite late. Hello, person who's just joined me. Okay, so what's going to happen is I have some basic notes. So uh, these little things here, I'm going to go over those and then I'm going to go into each topic in more detail from my detailed notes. So. Um, I'm sorry I don't do love and relationships I wish I did though that that sounds like a better course than my one I'm very sorry though <laughs> I'm very sorry I don't do it um but good luck anyway in your in your A-level you can stay if you want I won't be talking about love and relationships I'll be talking about politics but oh well um <laughs> sorry um so yeah, I'm going to do Late Republic, I'm going to be going over the main sort of stuff and uh, hopefully uh, get it all done today. So I'm going to be using my typical app, my Forest app, uh, which I love. Um, I'm just going to mention that I've, I've, for the past hour, I've been immersed in um, Latin grammar <laughs> and my brain's a bit fried. Uh, I've learnt every single relative pronoun uh, in the past half hour so I'm very very tired um well not tired my brain's just a bit weird so um yeah some of the things I say might not make sense please do make force me to clarify okay um thank you for the good luck uh Eve Sunny I don't know what your first name is thank you um good luck to you you'll be you'll be brilliant okay so uh hang on I'm just gonna start my stream okay so i'll put an hour because i don't think it's really gonna be longer than an hour this might be a two-part thing but yeah this is what we're gonna do plant the but right here we go okay so obviously when we look at the late republic we're gonna start with the politics of the late republic and um if you want a really comprehensive rundown of this, of course you can stay with me, but there are also some videos by a guy called Historia Kivilis, um, who who is brilliant and I love him and he does really interesting stuff as well. So do check him out if you're if that's the sort of you're into or if you just want a bit more uh, extra material to put into your exam. Okay, so initially in Roman society, there were two sets of people. So we had the patricians and the plebeians. Now, the patricians were sort of the important people. They were landowners and they controlled politics, law, religion and the military. Now, they controlled the military because they were members of the cavalry, because they had enough money to own horses. Uh, so then they were less likely to die. If you're on a horse, you're less likely to die than if you're... Um, cannon fodder really uh, on foot and they control politics because there is no salary for politicians in Rome they don't get any money so if you're being a politician you have to be able to support yourself obviously the plebeians who are young uh, and don't actually have that much money can't do that then we have the plebeians. They are the rest of the citizen body. They're normally farmers or tradesmen. Uh, they can't intermarry with patricians and they're completely excluded from authority. It's quite a nasty uh, group to belong to. They're very disenfranchised and you'll see this start to come out. And this is what causes a lot of the problems in Rome. So by the first half century, uh, 300s BC-ish, the plebeians gained a lot of equality because of their military importance, first of all. The military can't function without, uh, for want of a better word, cannon fodder. As you will know if you've ever studied any world wars, if you don't have the people who are going to go in there and fight, if you don't have the numbers, um, then you're not going to win, um, generally. Of course, Julius Caesar proves us wrong with that uh, in his civil war with Pompey because um, he actually has less men but he has more loyal soldiers and he's got better tactics than Pompey does so I'm getting ahead of myself but anyway they gained equality because of their 
military importance, but also because of the growing need for administrators of new territories. Rome is expanding and gaining more of an empire. It's not yet the Roman Empire, but it's got an empire, um, not the Roman Empire as we know it. So as they're expanding, they need more people to be able to look after these territories. They need more people to live in these territories to establish a Roman presence. And we'll see Julius Caesar work on this, but uh, this really starts in the 300s BC. So a pivotal year is 146 BC. Now, at this, in this year, the Roman forces destroyed Corinth and Carthage, Corinth in Greece and Carthage, modern day Turkey-ish, uh, uh, which got Rome and its aristocrats very, very rich. But because of this and all of these conquests, life got harder for the farmers. Now, these wars were very long. The Second Punic War was 16 years long. So farmers would return um, these farmer soldier ideas. Uh, they would return from war to find their farms run down and they, they would be past fixing. So they'd move to Rome to find work. And then after all of this conquest, they had an influx of slaves, which meant that demand for farm labourers fell because slaves were less expenses. You, you only had to feed slaves. You didn't have to pay them. Whereas if you were employing Roman citizens, you had to pay, pay them even if they were plebeians. So obviously any businessman's going to go, I'll have the slaves. They're much cheaper. Um, so a new social order out of this rose called the Equites. And they were called this because they could traditionally afford horses. In Latin, Equites means knights. Equus means horse. Uh, so, yes, uh, they come out and they take over commercial trade and banking because aristocrats, so the patricians, aren't allowed to do this. There's no specific reasoning behind it, but they're not allowed. They became very rich and educated because of this. And then we have a new set of people beginning to rise into prominence, which sort of puts the aristocrats out of joint a little bit. So moving on from this, we're going to look at the state's organisation. So the Senate had a hierarchy of offices known as the Cursus Honorum. That's the track of honour. You can imagine it a bit like a ladder that people have to climb up. So there, there are minimum age restrictions for each um, each office which are very important you've got to take those into account because it stops people from getting too much power too quickly and obviously we see that be very very corrupted and um, a lot of problems happen with that after um, the Gracchi uh, with Marius with Julius Caesar all of those sorts of people they are able to abuse this system so the first one on the Cursus Honorum is the Quaestor. They are in charge of finance, essentially, a bit like bankers. They're in charge of the state treasury. So they're dealing with all of the money. And that's the least sort of the less important thing. Next up from that, we have the ideals. Now, they are sort of in many ways propaganda ministers. Um, if you think about it, juvenile way after this but juvenile said um the upper classes keep the lower classes happy with panem et circenses and that's bread and circuses so what these ideals are in charge of as you can probably guess food and water games and maintenance of public buildings so they're basically in charge of keeping the young uh, well not the younger people uh, the poor people in check um so Basically, they're a bit like propaganda ministers. That's how I would think of them. Then that we have praetors. Now, praetors are in charge of juries and law courts. Uh, they're very, very important. Basically, uh, justice was a really important thing to the Romans. And it was something that the kings had um, held on to when the kings were around. So the praetors taking hold of this, it's a very important position. Then above those, we have the Senate, uh, the Senate, so the senators. Uh, this is made up of lots of magistrates with different areas of responsibility, and it increased from 300 to 680 BC by the instigation of the dictator Sulla. Then at the very top, we have consuls. Now, there are two per year. Uh, they have imperium, which is ultimate power, and it's a little bit like, uh, in many ways, a president, not really a prime minister, because they have more of a cabinet around them, but it's like a president. The thing is, though, there are two of them, so the power is split between them, and their terms only last for one year, so it stops them from getting too much power, and also, uh, an interesting way they run it, um, they have it so that the consuls alternate every month, so it's called holding fasces when you're in charge, and fasces are little um, symbolic 
bodyguard sticks. They're like weapons. Um, so the bodyguards would hold these and whoever held fast keys for that month would be able to push their own agenda through. And you found this where um, there was generally an unspoken agreement that they wouldn't go back on each other's ideas. But you will see this with... Um, Cicero with Caesar, uh, they are very careful to try and get things through in their first terms. And the person who gets the most votes gets the first term. So whoever gets the most votes will serve in January. And it goes on like that. OK, so there are three other uh, key um, offices outside of the Cursus Honorum. We have the tribunes of the plebs. So there, there's 10 of those appointed every year and their job is to appoint. Uh, to protect the plebs, um, protect their interests. Um, then we have the censors, there are two, and they are in charge of the city's morality, uh, but obviously that doesn't really get anything done. And the census, which, as you probably know, you probably have one if you're doing A-level, but uh, census, um, they count all of the people in Rome. They also sort out the senatorial role. So if you did imperial image, which to be honest, if you're doing this one, you probably did do. If you um, think of it as how Augustus, he as censor with Agrippa, decided who was going to be in the Senate. And because he was corrupt, he made sure it was all of his supporters. And then finally, we have a dictator. Now, dictator was a six month position. It was exceptional. And you had the imperium of both consuls. And it was only appointed for periods of six months. This was only in times of crisis. And the key example of this would be Cincinnatus. Now, he was a general in, I think it was around the 300s BC, who was given command. He was given di the dictatorship. And after six months, he'd sorted the problem out and given power back. He was the ideal dictator. That's what dictators were meant to do. And obviously, as you know from T Julius Caesar, they didn't do that. So then we have a sort of it, I, I call them political parties, but they're not really political parties, but we're just going to call them political parties. So they're not really political parties as we know them, but it's the noble people, the, so the nobiles, dividing into factions. So we have the optimates, which are a bit like the Tories, really. Um, they, the Tories, yeah, the Tories. Uh, and the populares, which are a bit like Labour, but um, back when they actually used to be proper Labour. Uh, and yes, that's basically it. So then we have patronage, which is a very important system uh, within Rome. So it's a reciprocal relationship and you have clients. So these are my client. Oh, hang on. Have I got anything I can use to illustrate? So these are my clients and these are my, oh, hang on. Let me get this in colourful. Something colourful will be better. These are my patrons. These are my clients. So we've got our patrons here. And the patrons um, are going to give the clients money and grain handouts, maybe a bit of food because they're poor. And in return, the clients are going to give them political support through graffiti, voting, etc. So it's very much a reciprocal relationship between rich and poor to get the rich vote and to get the poor food, essentially. That's how it is. So that's how that works. No legal basis existed for this. And so it's basically a way to garner political support. Now, typically in elections, candidates would have a lot of money and internal political support. But sometimes people would break through with massive charisma or a good reform plan. You can also gain your power base unconventionally, such as through support from your troops. So, for example, Gaius Marius or Julius Caesar. Now, as the um, historian Ronald Sine says in his Roman Revolution, it's a very good read, um, but very, very influenced by the Second World War. So um, his some of his stuff's a little bit screwed, uh, skewed, sorry. Uh, but he says um, he compares this relationship between the general and the soldiers as patronage. So he says the general had to be a politician for his legionaries were a host of clients. So that's basically how it works. Marius treats his troops like client, like his clients. So that's how he gets his support. That's how he is able to do what he does politically. If he didn't have that support as a novice homo, probably wouldn't be able to do that. Um, 
And then finally, just a little note, we have Tiberius Gracchus. Now, this is very much the point that a lot of people suggest that the Republic started to break down. Some people will suggest later with the advent of people like Marius and Sulla or Julius Caesar. But to be honest, I am more inclined to believe that it was around this time. So Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus was a really idealistic populares, and he put forward a land reform law called the Lex Sempronia Agraria in 133 BC. And this would stop corruption in the um, upper circles of Roman society and give land to the poorest people in Rome. Obviously, the Senate didn't like it, especially the Optimates. They did not like the fact that this guy was doing so much for the poor people. And what what really shows that Tiberius made a mistake, which I think was what led to what happens next. I'm not going to spoil it for you. Um, but what happens next? Um, he when the Senate refused to put it through, he went straight to the assembly. Um, which is vetoing, it's going past the Senate, you're not supposed to do that. But obviously the Assembly passed it because they're the Assembly of the Tribunes of the Plebs. Now, after this bill had been passed, the Senate got his fellow Tribune to veto him. So he took a thing to the Assembly saying he shouldn't be Tribune, he's not protecting the Plebs. So the Plebs got rid of this other tribune and then Tiberius insisted on putting through festival day after festival day after festival day thus stopping all of the shops from opening effectively shutting Rome down until the senate passed his bill this really annoyed the senate as you can probably tell and when they sort of got word that he was abusing his power, when they started to get annoyed uh, that he wasn't listening to them, they felt he was bypassing them. And obviously, when the little rumour of kingship started to spread, that he was wearing a purple robe, that he had gestured for a crown at a public meeting, they had him and 300 of his supporters killed and thrown into the Tiber so that they could not be buried quite nasty. His brother later attempts to do basically exactly the same land reform bill except goes a little further and winds up with the same fate and after this both him and his brother were um, sort of worshipped in Rome as heroes but I think this very much shows that this paranoia about kings and the rising power of individuals when they realised that they could abuse the system to get what they wanted I think this becomes why the Republic fails, because it's so able to be abused. And as well as this, the Senate just are so paranoid about kings coming about. And they're also paranoid about their own power being taken away, which leads them to rash acts. So I think that's, I think I've gone into a lot of detail on that. I might just have a little look. Hmm. Do I need to do anything else? Well, I, I could. Yeah, I could. Okay, so I've got some little stuff here, some more detailed stuff about Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus, and some stuff about Amicitia and Inimicitia, and some quotes about Tiberius. So I'll start off with Am Amicitia and Inimicitia. So another key relationship in Rome is that of Amicitia. This literally translates to friendship and is like a system of family alliances established over time to help further men. So Julius Caesar Augustus, or then Octavian, um, and the latter especially if one family did not have an heir. There is also Inimicitia, which those Latinists among you will know is the opposite of Amicitia, literally translating to hostility. This is a system where individual disagreements could extend into significant hostility between families. So it's very much uh, centred around family business. business. It's not the mafia, but it's a bit like the Mafia. Um, okay, so Tiberius Gracchus, here's a little rough timeline of his life, uh, telling you a bit about his character, and then we'll talk about why some, well, a bit about why people think that he was, um, why he decided to do what he did, why he was assassinated. So it's just some quotes from some contemporary historians. So timeline, he was born between 169 BC to 164 BC, but we're not entirely sure. His military career started in the Third Punic War as military tribune appointed to the staff of his brother-in-law. He became known for his bravery and discipline, recorded as the first to scale the walls. 
In 137 BC, he was appointed quaestor and served his term in Numantia. The campaign was unsuccessful and suffered major defeats. Tiberius is credited with signing a peace treaty with the Numantines and saving the army. Others argued that this made Rome appear weak, but it did save many lives. And Plutarch does argue that Tiberius would never have been assassinated had Scipio, the general whom Tiberius was working with, not been campaigning against the same Numantines when he was uh, rather than being in Rome. In 133 BC, he was elected tribune of the plebs and started to legislate on the matter of homeless veterans. From his speech at the Rostra, apparently he said, the wild beasts that roam over Italy have their dens, each has a place of repose and refuge, but the men who fight and die for Italy enjoy nothing but the air and light. Without house or home, they wander about with their wives and children. In 133 BC as well, he proposed the Lex Sempronia Agraria, which would redistribute land away from rich patricians and sought to benefit the Roman people. The Senate again were strongly against this bill, as they believed that it was attempting to incite social revolution. But the ways that Tiberius tried to pass the reforms didn't help either. He went straight to the plebeian assembly without even consulting the Senate. Marcus Octavius, the other tribune that I mentioned, tried to prevent the law from being passed, but Tiberius used his veto and then began to use it on daily ceremonial rites. He effectively shut down Rome until the Senate and Assembly passed his law, which makes him seem a bit like a tyrant. In 130 BC again, King Attalus III of Pergamum died and left his fortune to Rome, and Tiberius used his tribune powers to allocate all of the money to his new bill. Of course, the Senate didn't like this either. In 132 BC, after a scuffle while the tribes were being assembled, Tiberius was murdered along with 300 of his supporters, and their bodies were thrown into the Tiber. And there's some quotes about him uh, that I found from contemporary historians. We've got Plutarch saying, when Tiberius was on his way to Numantia, he passed through Etruria and found the country almost depopulated and its husbandmen and shepherds imported barbarian slaves. And there he first conceived the policy, which was to be a source of countless ills to himself and his brother. Then we have Quintus Pompeius, who was Tiberius's neighbour, and um, he said apparently that Eudemus of Pergamum had presented Tiberius with a royal diadem and a purple robe, believing that he was going to be king in Rome. And then Plutarch called the death of Tiberius the first outbreak of civil strife in Rome. Okay, so done that. Da, da, da. Right, okay. Ooh, there's so much stuff. Right, then we move on to Cato. Cato is my least favourite person in the world. I'm going to be honest. I mean, he's got some principles, I'll give him that, but he's, oh, he's a very boring man to learn about, isn't he? I mean, you'll all know that. He's, oh, such a dull person. But uh, yes. Uh, I'll have a look at him. So Cato the Younger is a statesman in the late Roman Republic and a follower of the Stoic philosophy known for his stubbornness. He was military tribune at Macedon in 67 BC and apparently he led his troops in the front eating and going to march with them. In 65 BC he was quaestor, in 63 BC he was tribune of the plebs. So he's going up the Cursus Honorum very incrementally, very carefully and he's following the rules. 61 BC he intervened in Caesar and Pompey's asks for the Senate to postpone consular elections so that they could have their triumphs. We'll get to that more but essentially um, you could not enter Rome while holding an army and the way that you disbanded an army um, if you were owed a triumph was you had to have that triumph. Because they hadn't had their triumph yet um, they weren't allowed back into Rome and they didn't want to give up their triumph. So what Pump, what happened to Pompey and Caesar? Um, because they wanted to run for consul, they asked that the consular elections be postponed so that they could have their triumphs and then run for consul because you could not run for consul outside of Rome. Um, and Cato does not allow this to happen. And in retaliation, both Caesar and Pompey give up their triumphs and go into Rome anyway, which is an unimaginable thing to do. You would not give up a triumph if you were a self-respecting politician in Rome. In 54 BC, oh, sorry, I've skipped one. In 60 BC, he was sent to Cyprus by Clodius, who is a man we'll learn a lot about, for foreign policy. And while he was there, he prepared perfect accounts. Now, this sort of came back to bite him um, or would have if he didn't have such a good uh, good um, 
sorry, not a good relationship, a good reputation. Because his reputation was so good, because they didn't believe that he would be corrupt, he was essentially believed um, when he prepared perfect accounts. Now, all of the people who had been in charge of Cyprus before him had siphoned off some money for themselves. Cato didn't do this. So when his accounts were so different to the other accounts, he would have had investigation, but he was so so sort of, well, I wouldn't say liked, but he had such a good reputation for not being corrupt and being um, st stuck to his principles and stoic that uh, he didn't get in trouble for it, but he could have. Um, in 54 BC, he was praetor, and in 52 BC, he ran for consul, but he was unsuccessful. Now, he said after this that he'd accepted the result he wasn't going to run again. Um, P. Marin, who is a historian, gives three reasons why she thinks that he might have run for consul. The first is family tradition. The second is the real power that the uh, consulship held. And the third was um, going, up the cons uh, going up the cursus honorum. He... I think he was probably angry about this, but, you know, you have to accept the result. I think he very much knew that he couldn't ignore the results, so he just let it happen. He 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 wasn't stupid, I'm just going to say that. And, um, yeah, he knew that he couldn't just do it. He knew he had to follow the rules unlike many other people. Uh, so 49 BC, he called for the Senate to remove Caesar's imperium as he was waiting outside to come back into the city after his conquest of Gaul. Um, the Senate tried to, um, which would allow Caesar to be prosecuted. Caesar wouldn't let them. They told Caesar to disarm. He refused. They asked Pompey and Caesar to disarm. Caesar refused. Uh, he said Pompey should disarm first. Pompey said, I'm not disarming first. Uh, there was a very, very big drama about it. And then he crosses the Rubicon and that starts the civil war. Cato goes with the Senate and uh, all the way to Dyrrhachium in Greece. And then February 46 BC, the Battle of Thapsus is lost by the Senate and Cato and Pompey and everyone. And in April 46 BC, Cato commits suicide after his defeat at Thapsus. Now, the story of this, apparently he stabbed himself in the stomach after reading Plato's De Republica. Um, he, he stabbed himself in the stomach and as he stabbed himself, he knocked a table over and his slaves yelled, in, in panic, he, and his son and his friends came running. A surgeon came as well and sewed him back up, and Cato was sort of knocked out at this point. And he woke up and he saw what the surgeon was trying to do, pushed him away and tore out his bowels and immediately died. Uh, very gruesome, um, but I think it shows just how stoic he is. And Peter Jones, I can't remember the exact quote, but he does say that Romans regarded suicide as an active... Um, process rather than a passive one so uh, to commit suicide was a noble death so in doing this Cato had a really stoic Roman death which um, yes I'm just going to go into stoicism because I realised I haven't actually talked about it so stoicism was a philosophy thought of by the Greek Zeno and when he came to Rome it became really popular in Rome because it tied in with the idea of duty towards the state stoicism valued things sort of like keeping a stiff upper lip um living frugally not um like playing by the rules essentially and sticking by your principles and that's exactly what Cato did in his death and he did this all throughout his life um he's a very good stoic he but it's to his detriment really um he is ridiculously stubborn in his stoicism and that then stopped that basically causes his death and the civil war um so we're going to examine some relationships that he had uh, the first of these would be Cato and Cicero so Cato saw Cicero as inferior and this is because Cicero was a novice homo now a novice homo is a new man in English and what it, what a new man is is a man who doesn't have any previous politicians in his family and this makes it really hard for you to actually get into political life at Rome there are a lot of families such as the Valeriae and the Fabii who have about 45 parts 
com consuls. So they tend to control most of the political arena in Rome. They have most of the power. Whereas novice homo, being a novice homo is quite difficult. However, people like Cicero and Marius manage to break through, and this is through normally skill in other areas. So Cicero was good at speaking, he was a great orator, um, and Marius was a brilliant general. That's how they tend to break through. They're not just really entitled to political office as many other people were, as Cato really was, because he had multiple consuls in his family. His grandfather had been a consul, I believe his father had been a consul uh, before he was killed in the social war, and his uncle was killed in the social war, social war as well, his uncle was a consul too. So Cato saw him as, in, as inferior because he was a novice homo, and the optimates didn't really like novice homos very much. Um, the populares tended to be more sympathetic towards them. They also admired each other's beliefs. Uh, they have very similar beliefs. They're both sort of aligned with the optimates faction. They're both very, uh, I, I would say, stoic, but Cicero is far less stubborn than him. Cicero knows how to be pragmatic. Uh, Cicero knows how to protect himself, um, probably a bit more selfish than Cato, I'd suggest. In 63 BC, Cato stood against Cicero at the battle or the trial of Morena, um, but that sort of pales into insignificance when he also helped Cicero with the Catiline conspiracy, and he spoke for Cicero's um, argument for the death penalty for the conspirators. We will get to the Catiline conspiracy in more detail, but essentially puts Roman citizens to death not a smart thing to do, but they do it, and it haunts Cicero for the rest of his life. In 50 BC, Cato refused to grant Cicero a public honour. Uh, this is because Cicero had led a successful campaign in uh, Cilicia when he was governor there, and at this campaign, his troops had held him imperator, which made him elig uh, eligible for a triumph. Um, but he refused. He was among very few who refused to grant him a triumph. And in 46 BC, Cicero wrote a pro-Cato pamphlet after his death, which was uh, very positive about Cato, uh, said, um, uh, what was the quote from it that I got? Rome, Cato may not have needed Rome, but Rome still needed Cato. Uh, he's very positive about him. And in response, Caesar writes a very nasty anti-Cato pamphlet, which is uh, generally regarded as very cruel. So I think in their relationship overall, they weren't best friends. Cicero did criticise Cato's very strong beliefs um, rather a lot. But overall, um, they had quite similar ideals. Um, the only thing I would say, it's a quote from H.H. Scullard who says that even Cicero complained that uh, that Cato behaved as if he lived in the Republic of Plato rather than the sink of Romulus. Uh, so he's basically saying Cato is far too idealistic uh, for Rome. He doesn't seem to understand that Rome is not worthy of this idealism. Rome does not function with this idealism. And Cato and Caesar as a little group uh, in 60 BC, um, he... Cato refused Caesar's request for elections to be postponed for consuls so he could triumph. And in 49 BC, he fought against him in the civil war and also basically caused the civil war against him. And in 46 BC, Caesar wrote a call anti Cato after his death. Generally, Cato is basically just a paragon of stoic virtue. He's very much offsetting the other two people. I genuinely think that the uh, exam board only put him in because they had two, they had a very, very um, self absorbed person um, in Cicero, obviously, um, who was pragmatic. They have Caesar, who was extremely successful, extremely um, famous. And then you've got Cato, who is not as famous as the other either of the others, and six to his principles. So you've got sort of a range over there. Um, and I think the one, the quote that really sums it up, him up for me is from H.H. H. Scullard. It's in the textbook. And um, he says, his death symbolised the death of the Republic. He was idealised as a martyr of Republican liberty and a paragon of Stoic virtue. So yeah, 
Um, I'll just have a look at my other notes and see if I've got anything else that I can tell you about. Hmm. Yes, I do. Right. Okay. So, uh, I've got some quotes for you. Then I've got um, what he did successfully, other optimates, and another relationship with Clodius. So, some quotes about him. Most of them are from Plutarch uh, about his childhood. So, Plutarch says, uh, Quintus Papidius Sido made a visit to Marcus Livius and met the children. He asked their support for his cause and all nodded and smiled except for Cato, who stared suspiciously at the guest. Silo demanded an answer and, getting no response, took Cato and hung him from the window by his feet. He still wouldn't say anything. So he's very, very stubborn. Um, more stubbornness. Uh, the children were playing a game of a mock trial and one of the children was convicted and carried out of the room when he cried for Cato. Cato became very angry with the other children and grabbed the child away. Then Plutarch again, showing his stubbornness. Uh, the next two ones are Plutarch showing his stubbornness. Uh, the R Roman ritual military game Troy was being played and one of the adult organisers appointed two leaders, but the teenagers would not tolerate one of them, a nephew of Pompey, and refused to obey beneath him. When Sulla asked them who they would prefer, they all cried Cato. And then as respected nobles were being led to execution from Sulla's villa, Cato, aged about 14, asked his tutor why no one had killed the dictator yet. Sarpedon said about, uh, they fear him, my child, more than they hate him. And Cato replied, give me a sword that I might free my country from slavery. After this, Sarpedon was careful not to leave him unattended around the capital. Plutarch again, uh, the commission uh, of Clodius for him to go and help foreign policy in Cyprus. He saw it as an attempt to get rid of him and refused. Um, <laughs> and P. Marin, uh, she says about Cato's stubbornness that while the people might have applauded Cato for his moral integrity, this did not necessarily translate to votes for his consulship. So his relationship with Clodius, Publius Clodius Pulcher um, was from a patrician background and was well known for his populism. Um, his main job was Tribune of the Plebs in 58 BC, for which he got uh, himself adopted into the Plebeian order uh, by Julius Caesar. In 66 BC, he was rumoured to have started a mutiny during the war against Mithridates. He was also alleged to have been sleeping with his sister Claudia. And in 62 BC, he was dressed as a woman to infiltrate the Bonadea festival, which was women only, and was rumoured to be having an affair with Julius Caesar's wife, who was hosting it. He was taken to trial and got off free because he bribed the jury. And then eventually he ruled Rome for, with mob violence for, I believe it was about two years, and then eventually was killed by a guy called Milo. And if you've read Cicero's Pro Milone, you will know all about that. Cicero's great disaster. Uh, obviously, he sent Cato away for quite a while to Cyprus um, to get him out of the way. So we can definitely suggest they have very clashing principles. They um, very much don't like each other. That's what I'm going to say. Um, what did he do successfully? So during his political careers, he did actually do some pretty good things, despite seeming rather useless. Uh, so they're listed below. So 63 BC, he spoke with such eloquence and authority at the Catiline hearings that the Senate was virtually unanimous in agreeing with him and putting the conspirators to death. As tribune in the same year, he reduced the price of grain and extended the corn dole to double the original eligible group. Now, this is quite interesting because this is not a typically optimates um, policy. Uh, the optimates didn't really care about the plebeians really um apart from for their own advancement and it was normally the populares who would do stuff to do with the corn dole but cato did see that they needed support from the plebeians so he did double the corn dole so that's a rare instance of pragmatism on his behalf uh, a rare instance of him not actually doing things as he might believe he should uh in 52 BC, he supported a law that went against virtually all of his principles, showing that he could be pragmatic again. The previous year had been very upheaved, and so perhaps this was fitting with the times, though. And in 50 BC, he vetoed, along with 22 of his fellow optimates, Curio's possibility. A proposition that Caesar and Pompey should hand over their imperium. They very much wanted to support Pompey uh, to go against Caesar and get rid of him rather than have both of them 
um, lay down arms. And then we must consider the other optimates who he was working with at this point. So we have uh, a lot of other ones in his faction, and these are sort of the key ones. So we have Quintus Hortensius Hortalus, who was consul in 69 BC and was his, uh, the guy who went against him in the trial uh, for Veres. He was a successful defence lawyer who married Cato's own wife to have heirs. Bit weird, but... That's fine. Quintus Lutatius Catulus, who was consul in 78 BC, made a career of constantly defending the Republic as a lawyer and opposing Pompey and Caesar. Quintus Caecilius Metellus Keller, who was consul in 60 BC, um, and his family, the Metelli family, um, they were all optimates and fought vigorously to defend their position. Quintus successfully opposed Pom Pompey through his consulship and was imprisoned for this. Then we have Lucius Licinius Lucullus, who was consul in 74 BC. He was a successful general who'd won a number of victories in his career, replaced by Pompey after taking too long against Mithridates. And Marcus Calpurnius Bibulus, consul 59 BC. He was consul at the same time as Julius Caesar and tried to block Caesar's land bills that would benefit Pompey's veterans. After a series of protests, he was shoved to the ground in the forum and a bucket of feces was poured over him. He quit his duties as a consul and stayed in his house, trying to stop Caesar by declaring every single day a festival day. But obviously, that was very unsuccessful. Right. Hmm. Okay, do, do I really have time to do Caesar? I think I do. Yeah, yeah, I've got time. Okay. So Caesar actually surprisingly follows a relatively traditional career path with some instances of what's he doing. So we start with Quaestor in 69 BC, then he goes to Ideal in 65 BC, and the first anomaly is Pontifex Maximus in 63 BC. Now him running for this is not wrong. It's not unusual, but it is a bit strange because normally old men who had been through the entire Cursus Honorum would go for the Pontifex Maximus. At this point, Caesar was late 30s. He's not really an old man. So this young upstart politician running, going for Pontifex Maximus was quite strange. He did win it, though, and he had that for the rest of his life. Um, he was praetor in 62 BC, governor in 61 BC, and consul in 59 BC. Uh, just before that, in 60 BC, the first triumvirate was formed, and as H.H. H. Scholar calls it, that was the ultimate origin of the civil war in both its breakup and its formation. So the main bit where he does the most damage as a politician well damage most stuff as a politician where he has the most effect as a politician would be his first consulship in 59 bc now during his first consulship julius caesar had marcus calpurnius bibulus as colleague he did a lot of things and a lot of these were illegal so the first thing he did was publish um order all of the senate's proceedings to be published uh, this would mean that there would be scrolls put outside the Senate House and people could read what had been going on in the Senate. So it's uh, an idea of transparency against corruption, which he was against a lot in his career. He also did his first land reform bill, which was quite a good one, actually, uh, and it did get through. And he made a point of reading out uh, in full every single clause of the bill to um, ensure that it would be passed and ask for any objections after every single line. So he was very thorough. Um, that's what we like about him. Um, he, he put up a law against extortion. Um, he And then he did some illegal stuff. So he had Cato dragged from the Senate when he argued, when he tried to filibuster his land reform bill, which is very, very illegal. He had him imprisoned. And, and in protest at this, a lot of the Senate senators just got up and left. And when Caesar asked where they were going, one of the senators said to him, I would rather be in prison with Cato than in the Senate house with Caesar. So they didn't they weren't exactly pushovers i don't think you can say that the republic was too weak and julius caesar just pushed past it i think it's a lot of him being very forceful i'd say uh, mildly um and then there's a feces incident which is also it sounds absolutely exciting obviously um and uh, that was also illegal so um basically he was speaking at the rostra uh, to 
I think it was at the assembly in the Ros to the assembly at the Rostra to pass a bill. It might have been the first land reform bill. And Bibulus was approaching to veto it, and the mob went insane. Uh, even as he was shouting that he was vetoing it, they attacked him and poured a bucket of manure over his head. After this incident, he was so embarrassed that he refused to leave his house, Satan's house, fearing for his life, and declared every single day a festival day to try and stop Caesar from being able to do anything. But that didn't really work because Caesar was Pontifex Maximus, so he had ultimate jurisdiction over when festival days were. So Caesar could just go, no, it's not. And then he'd be able to do what he wanted. Um, in fact, Bibulus was so ineffective during this consulship that a lot of people called it the year of the consuls Julius and Caesar. After the consulship, he went off for the Gallic campaigns, and so he still had imperium that he'd had during his consulship and could not be prosecuted for the illegal acts that he had done. This consulship and general thing continued until 49 BC, where Cato argued for him to be stripped of imperium and made an enemy of the state. Caesar crossed the Rubicon when it looked like he wasn't getting anywhere, and um, the Senate declared him an enemy of the state. And he, by doing this, he declared civil war and Pompey and the Senate fled to Dyrrhachium. The war was ended in February 46 BC at the Battle of Thapsus, when Caesar soon travelled to Egypt, received Pompey's head, which apparently he, we he wept at, um, and a baby from Cleopatra, and then returned to Rome in September 47 BC. Um, in 48 BC, he was dictator. Now, he was appointed to this by the Senate, but it is heavily suggested that he sort of appointed himself to it, and the Senate didn't really say no. Um, so as dictator, he did a lot of quite good things. He built a forum, Ulium and Basilica. <sighs> Sorry. Uh, the forum, Ulium, he didn't finish. Augustus finishes this. Uh, he also improved the roads. He increased uh, the number of senators to 900, essentially putting another 300 of his supporters in. He makes building improvements. He builds flood protection from the Tiber. So he's actually doing quite a lot of things to improve the city of Rome. He also gives a lot of these um, impoverished um, people within Rome because so many of these farmers, as I mentioned earlier, have had to move to Rome to find work after these really long wars. He gives them um, he gives them work. He gives thousands of people work through his building programs and. By making more provinces in Gaul, he, he offers people money incentives to go over and live in Gaul, and that gives them a new life, new farms, new world. His big mistake was being declared dictator perpetuo in February 44 BC. That was a very, very, very big mistake. Dictator perpetuo was too much for the Senate. Caesar was far too cocky, and he was basically becoming a king, although not in name. So they assassinated him on the Ides of March, and as you know, um, as Caesar says, a to Brute in Mark, oh no, sorry, in Julius Caesar. That's a bit of a problematic, he didn't say that. Apparently, uh, as I've heard from more contemporary accounts he was grabbed and he said why this violence and then as he fell to the floor he covered his face um, so that none of them would see him die. Valerius Paterculus who was Tiberius um, the later emperor's court historian suggested that considerable animosity had been roused towards Caesar thanks to Mark Antony. Antony had set a royal diadem on Caesar's head and uh, Caesar refused it although the refusal said no offence on Caesar's part. So basically he seemed like he was becoming a king which is very problematic for the Romans. The first triumvirate. So the triumvirate uh, was formed in 59 BC slash 60 BC, as we know, and the way it worked was Julius Caesar was popular and a good speaker, so he did all the political canvassing. Pompey had the um, forces and the fame, and Crassus had the money. So that's essentially it was a three-pronged um, thing, and once you lose one of them, so say Crassus is at the top, and over here I've got Pompey and Caesar, once we lose Crassus in 53 BC to the campaign in Parthia, when he gets gold poured in his mouth, we've got two people pulling in opposite directions, 
and that's never going to work. So the trial where it works because it's stable, you've got three people's interests going, they're all um, sort of balancing each other out. But when we lose one, it doesn't work. And that's what exactly what happens. So it seems to have broken up quite slowly. Uh, Pompey had married Julia Caesar's daughter in 59 BC, but she died in 54 BC in childbirth and their child died as well. So that entire link was gone. Uh, with the death of one girl and it this became worse when Pompey married a leading conservative's daughter so that's Pius Scipio Nazica um, he marries his daughter and that changes his allegiance to the Optimates rather than to the Populares who support Caesar and then Crassus who's the other part of their triumvirate other part of their triangle gets killed in 53 BC in Cari by the Parthians uh, because he um because he annoyed them basically um so we have two key relationships with Pompey and Caesar. Um, Pompey and Caesar? Caesar. Uh, so we've got Pompey, as I've just given away. So they were connected by Julia from 59 to 54 BC. Apparently Pompey was very in love with Julia as well, so that probably cemented his loyalty to Julius Caesar, Caesar even more. I think a lot of senators joked that um, he was becoming soft. And this was probably to his detriment as well, because the problem was that when they started the Civil War, Pompey hadn't actually been in charge of an army for a very long time. So this led to him being, I wouldn't say experienced, inexperienced on the battlefield, but I'd say rusty on the battlefield. And this leads to him not really being able to do much against this war-hardened Caesar who has been at war for the past seven years, roughly. Um, we also have Caesar supports Pompey in the Senate and vice versa, but they are against each other in the Civil War. Yeah, he still did weep at Pompey's corpse. And then we have Caesar and Cicero. Caesar really admired Cicero. They had a lot of common interests in uh, literature and oratory, and Caesar constantly sought Cicero's approval. He asked Cicero to join the triumvirate, and Cicero refused. Um, he Cicero followed Pompey in the Civil War, and Caesar pardoned Cicero in 47 BC after the Civil War. Um, but Cicero was pro-Cato, and Caesar was anti-Cato. So while they admired each other, they did have very different ideas about certain things, especially about certain people like Cato, who had just frustrated Caesar, um, but had been quite close. Uh, well, I wouldn't say close. I'd say more admired by Cicero. So if I got anything I want to add. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll go into a bit more detail on the first triumvirate. I've got a quote, two quotes. I've got multiple quotes. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, okay. So the first triumvirate, so we, they form it in the 60 BC. It's no official recognition, but it functions as a powerful political amicitia. And the alliance was held together in many ways. We've got the marriage, we've got Crassus funding Caesar's election campaigns and his spectacles, such as gladiator fights and theatre shows in order to win the favour of the people of Rome. Little known, Caesar does marry Crassus's aunt as well. Uh, and Caesar supported Pompey's land bills for his veterans in 67 and 66. BC. However, they begin to break down um, after I think Cicero suggests that Pompey became kind of jealous after Caesar's campaigns in Gaul. Um, so they met up in Lucca in 56 BC to re-establish their alliance and all were allocated a further five years of imperium in their provinces at this meeting. But then certain things happened that weakened their alliance even further. So Julia died and Pompey remarried, Crassus was killed in 53 BC and there were no elections in 52 BC because of street warfare and Clodius was killed by his rival Milo so the whole state was falling apart, not just the triumvirate. Pompey did initially seem to still support Caesar because he backed a law allowing him to stand as consul in absence and so allowing him to stay under imperium. However, he did not ensure that Caesar retained command of Gaul while giving himself five more years in command of Spain. In 50 BC, when news came that Syria was being threatened by the Parthians and the Senate suggested that both Pompey and Caesar send a legion, Pompey sent one that he'd loaned to Caesar, thus weakening him even further. And finally, when Caesar refused to give up Imperium on the first of September, uh, first of December, fifty BC, Pompey was asked to defend Rome against Caesar, and he agreed to do so. Civil war began. And a few little quotes about him. So, Lucy Cresswell, 
suggests that frustration and bruised dignitas must have contributed to the formation of the triumvirate. Livy suggests uh, he's a contemporary historian uh, around the time of Augustus, and he suggests that the first triumvirate was a conspiracy against the state by its three leading citizens. H.H. H. Scullard again suggested that there were now three dictators in Rome, although the title was carefully avoided. And Lucy Cresswell again says that the crossing of the Rubicon can be looked at as the revolutionary act of a deeply ambitious individual ready to take on the state of Rome or the behaviour of a man with few realistic options left. And then we have quotes on Caesar's relationships, mostly with Catherine Tempest. Cicero did not hate Caesar as a man, but he did hate the fact that Caesar had no desire to restore the Republic. Now, I think that's what I'm going to do for today. I know it's not an hour, but I don't really see the point in starting... Um, you know, in starting... Cicero now when he's such a big topic because all of the sources are about him so I will leave it there um thank you for watching I hope that was helpful for you sorry again um Isani it's not your name um but so, sorry for not um being able to help you with love and relationships I wish I'd been able to uh but thank you for watching I hope that was really helpful for you please do let me know in the comments if you've got any questions because I will try to answer them to the best of my ability and um yeah, I'll uh, I'll probably do Cicero Friday, I think. Maybe tomorrow, probably Friday. I've got an exam on Friday morning, so uh yeah, that will be out of the way and then I'll do Cicero. Okay. Um thank you for watching. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.